Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ed Flynn. I am the City Council President. Viewers can watch the City Council meeting live on YouTube by visiting boston.gov slash Please sign in City Hall. Um, please be respectful. Do not disrupt the meeting. Um, Mr. Clerk, will you please call the roll to ascertain the presence of a quorum, please? Councilor Arroyo. Present. Councilor Arroyo, present. Councilor Baker. Yeah. Councilor Baker, present. Councilor Bach. Present. Councilor Bach, present. Councilor Braden. Present. Councilor Braden, present. Councilor Edwards. Present. Councilor Edwards, present. Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Council Fernandez Anderson present. Council Flaherty. Yeah. Council Flaherty present. Council Flynn. Here. Yeah. Council Flynn present. Council Lara. Council Lara present. Council Louis Jen. Council Louis Jen present. Council Mejia. Council Murphy. Council Murphy present. And Council Worrell. Council Worrell present. Mr. President, we have a quorum. I have been informed by the clerk that clerk that a quorum is present. Um, Councilor Kenzie Bach will be introducing Father Roman from the St. Andrew um, Ukrainian Orthodox Church as our clergy for today. Uh, Council Bach, if you would come to the podium, please. Um, thank you so much, President Flynn. Uh, as all of our thoughts um, are with Ukrainians in Ukraine and also with our Boston Ukrainian community. Um, it is uh, my honor today to introduce Father Roman from the St. Andrew Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Um, the parish of St. Andrew uh, has long stood in Jamaica Plain in Councillor Lara's district um, and uh, it ministers to people of Orthodox faith, both of Ukrainian and non-Ukrainian heritage. Um, and Father Roman has been serving this parish for almost 20 years. Um, so we're honored to have him here to pray with us today and to give us a, an opportunity as a council to join our prayers with the prayers of the Ukrainian people in the whole world. Thank you. Father Roman. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and Can I this? Yeah. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, as you know, Father Roman Taranowski. I served in Church St. Andrew's Ukrainian Orthodox Church. And thank you that you invited me today, that you included myself for this beautiful people. And uh, we will pray for peace of Ukraine. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord, our God, great and almighty, we, your sinful children, turn to you with humility in our hearts and bow our heads low before you. We beseech your loving kindness and abundant blessing upon the nation, the people of Ukraine, during these days of great danger to their safety and well-being. Our brothers and sisters, Lord, are once again treated by aggressors who see them only as simple obstacles blocking the path to the complete domination of the precious land and the resources of the country of Ukraine. Strengthen the people as they face this great danger, turning to you in the immeasurably deep faith, trust, and love they have placed in you all their lives. Send your heavenly legions, O Lord, commanded by the patron of Kiev, Archangel Michael, to crush the desires of the aggressor whose desire is to eradicate your people. Grant unity of mind, heart, and soul, O Lord, to all leaders in public service with those they serve. Unite them all into one great Christian family 
so that together, as brothers and sisters, they may glorify your majestic name, God in the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. May I say something? Thank you. Our dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for gathering here today to stand up against the cynical evil and uh, inexcusable attack of my ancestral homeland, Ukraine, as bombs and rockets continue to fall on our peaceful cities. We look on in absolute horror and shock. Our infrastructure destroyed, architectural and historical buildings, monuments and churches damaged, families displaced. Never in our dreams did we envision our people having to once again sleep in bomb shelters. Never did we think that we would have to explain to our children why their kindergartens and playgrounds being bombarded and why there are other human beings trying to kill us. This is all hard to bear, but bear it we will. Our people are loving, kind, charitable, but they are also strong, courageous, full of resolve and ready to fight to defend their way of life. With all of you on our side, we know we are not alone. We thank our Western partners, the Biden administration, the civil authorities in Massachusetts, and all nations who are standing shoulders to shoulders with us. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. I believe that together we will prevail. God bless you all for your kindness and love. Glory to Ukraine. Glory to our heroes. God bless America. Thank you very much. Okay. At this time, Please join us with a pledge of Thank you, Father Roman, and thank you, Councilor Bach. <clears throat> thank you, Father, for those powerful words and for the prayer. Yeah, at this time, um, Father, could you come back up and join us? We'd love to get a photo with you and our colleagues in the City Council. Thank you, Father. My colleagues.
Thank you, Father, and thank you to my colleagues and Councilor, Councilor Kenzie Bork, um, for coordinating this important message and prayer. Approval of, approval of the minutes. Now on to the first order of business, which is the approval of the minutes. Seeing and hearing no discussion on the minutes on this matter, the chair moves to approve the minutes from the last meeting as presented. All of those in favor of approving the minutes from the last meeting say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. Thank you. The, meeting, the minutes of the last meeting stand as approved. Communications from Her Honor the Mayor. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0312. Docket number 0312, message in order for your approval an ordinance regarding targeted residential picketing to protect the quality of residential life in our city. Thank you. Docket 0312 will be referred to the Committee on Government Operations. Mr. Clerk, please read Docket 0313. Docket number 0313, message in order for an appropriation order in the amount of $27,205,854 from fiscal year 2022 Community Preservation Fund revenues for community preservation projects at the recommendation of the City of Boston Community Preservation Committee. The Chair calls on um, at-large City Council Michael Flaherty. Council Flaherty. And I look forward to chairing an expedited hearing. Uh, hope to get something on the council chamber calendar uh, very soon, uh, prior to the beginning of our budget uh, process, so that there are no uh, delays and backlogs to funding these very uh, worthwhile um, projects. So we get 27.2 million, 14.6 uh, for housing, 6.1 for um, historic preservation, and 6.5 for open space and recreation. So uh, I'll make sure we get notice out to all our colleagues so they can attend and. Uh, advocate and learn about projects that are happening in their uh, in their respective districts. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Flaherty. Um, docket 0313 will be referred to the Committee on Community Preservation Act. Mr. Clerk, please read Docket 0314. Docket number 0314, message in order for your approval, in order for a short-term extension of nine of the 14 remaining urban renewal plans in Boston. The Chair calls on District City Councilor Frank Baker. Uh, Council Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to make a, uh, um, a quick announcement about this, this docket number here. Between um, Council Bach and myself, Council Bach, had a, we had a hearing scheduled to talk about some of the powers of BPDA. A lot of them fall under urban renewal, so we've decided to cancel next week's um, hearing and roll it in, roll it into this 0314. So, just so people have a little bit of clarification. Thank you. Thank you, Council Baker. <clears throat> Docket 0314 will be referred to the Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation. Mr. Clerk, can you please read Docket 0316 through 0319 together? Yes, um, Mr. Clark, please read docket 0315. Docket number 0315, message in order for the confirmation of the reappointment of Eugenia Smith as a member of the Boston Housing Authority Monitoring Committee for a term expiring February 28, 2024. Docket number 0316, message in order for the confirmation of the reappointment of Mina Carr as a member of the Boston Housing Authority Monitoring Committee for a term expiring February 28, 2024. Docket number 0317. Message in order for the confirmation of the reappointment of Margarita LeBron as a member of the Boston Housing Authority Monitoring Committee for a term expiring February 28, 2024. Docket number 0318. Message in order for the confirmation of the reappointment of Julieta Lopez as a member of the Boston Housing Authority Monitoring Committee for a term expiring February 28th, 2024. And docket number 0319, message in order for the confirmation of the reappointment of Matilda Drayton as a member of the Boston Housing Authority Monitoring Committee for a term expiring February 28th, 2024. Thank you, Mr. Clark. 
Uh, Council Alara, Chair of the Committee on Housing and Community Development, is seeking suspension of the rules and passage of these dockets. We had similar dockets in the last meeting, which we also suspended the rules and passed. Um, Council Alara, are you looking to speak on this? Okay, okay. Um, we will take the vote on each docket separately. The chair, the chair recognizes District City Council uh, Frank Baker. Council Baker, you have the floor. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to make a point about the last meeting when we did uh, suspend and pass the, the new members for the, the, this housing board. Um, at, the, at the time it was happening, I was unable to speak. I was having something going on. But um, I think it's our duty for, for confirmations, especially when they're not reappointments, new people, um, I'm sure you don't know what the housing housing board does. So the reason for hearings and reason for confirmation of the people that are coming on those boards are for us to find out what they do. It, it isn't just asking people who they are, what they like, what color you have. It's what, why are you good at the, going to be good for our city in this job? And actually, what does the, what does the job entail? So we would also be asking um, BHA, um, executives probably I would think what what the task of the housing board is just a statement here mr. mr. president I'm not looking these are all reappointments and and um, we we routine, routinely um, suspend and pass reappointments but I think with appointments we should be looking we fight for confirmation powers school committee I think at a baseline should come here and we should confirm those school committee appointments. That's something that we don't have in the original legislation that um, Eddie's, Eddie's dad put forth. The original legislation had city council um, confirmation powers within it when the legislation came back to us. Those, those confirmation powers were taken out for the school committee. I stand up because there's a reason why we have confirmation powers. So. Um, just a statement. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilor Baker. Um, thank you for those comments. They, they are very helpful. Um, as these are reappointments, um, Councilor Laura is seeking suspension of the rules in passage of these dockets. Um, we will take the vote on each docket separately. Um, Mr. Cork on docket. 0315. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah. On Dock 0315, Council Laura seeks suspension of the rules in passage. Again, Dock 0315. All those in, in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Dock 0315. Council Alara is seeking suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0316. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 0316 has passed. Council Alara is seeking suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0317. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 0317 has passed. Um, Council Alara is seeking suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0318. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 0318 has passed. Council Alara is seeking suspe suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0319. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 0319 has passed. Reports of public officers and other. Mr. Kirk, please read docket 0320. Docket number 0320. Communication was received from the city clerk regarding the 2021-2022 University Accountability Statistical Report. Thank you. Docket 0320 will be placed on file. Reports of committee. For the next few dockets on the agenda, 
Council Flaherty, who is the Chair of the Committee on Public Safety, Criminal Justice, would you like to speak about dockets 0159, 0161, 0162, 0163, 0164, and 0166 together? The, the Chair rec recognizes at large City Council. Okay. Um, let me, yeah, uh, Mr. Clerk, please read those into the record. Document number 0159, the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal, Criminal Justice, to which was referred on January 26, 2022. Document number 0159, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $24,154,518.50 in the form of a grant for the federal fiscal year 2020 Staffing for Adequate Fire and Emergency Response, SAFER grant, awarded by the Federal Emergency Management Agency to be administered by the Fire Department. The grant will fund training for a class of 85 recruits at the Boston Fire Department Training Academy and reimbursement for their salaries for 36 months. Submits a report recommending the order ought to pass. Docket number 0161. The Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice, to which was referred on January 26, 2022. Docket number 0161. Message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $2,500,000 in the form of a grant for the federal year, fiscal year 2021 National Sexual Assault Kit Initiative, awarded by the United States Department of Justice to be administered by the Police Department. The grant will fund three positions, coordinator, criminologist, and victim advocate. Overtime, travel, and sub-awards and training submits a report that the order ought to pass. Docket number 0162, the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice, which was referred on January 26, 2022. Docket number 0162, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $527,586 in the form of a grant for the fiscal year 21 Connected and Protect, awarded by the United States Department of Justice to be administered by the Boston Police Department. The grant will fund clini clinician-directed project coordinator, community partnerships for translation and outreach, and staff costs for Section 12 activities carried out by the Boston Emergency Services Team in partnership with the Boston Police Department Street Outreach Unit submits a report recommending the order ought to pass. Docket number 0163, the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice to which was referred on January 26, 2022. Docket number 0163, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $491,316 in the form of a grant for First Responders Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act Cooperative Agreement awarded by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services to be administered by the Fire Department. The grant will fund a collaborative effort between the Boston Fire Department, First Responders, the Mayor's Office of Recovery Services, the Boston Public Health Commission, and community-based organizations to improve the city's response to opioid overdoses. Year four of a four-year grant submits a report recommending the order ought to pass. Docket number 0164, the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice to which was referred on January 26, 2022. Docket number 0164, message in order authorizing the city of Boston to accept and expend the amount of 272000 and $13 in the form of a grant for fiscal year 2021 DNA capacity enhancement and backlog reduction program awarded by the United States Department of Justice to be administered by the police department. The grant will fund two criminalist positions, overtime, lab supplies, and continuing education expenses. Submits a report recommending the order ought to pass. In docket number 0166, the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice, to which was referred on January 26, 2022, docket number 0166. 
Message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $125,000 in the form of a grant for federal fiscal year 21 Violence Against Women Act stock grant awarded by the United States Department of Justice passed, passed through the Massachusetts Executive Office of Public Safety and Security to be administered by the Police Department. The grant will fund civilian violence advocate who provide services for victims in Jamaica Plain, East Boston, Charlestown, and overtime for all domestic violence advocates. Submits a report recommending that the order ought to pass. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Uh, the Chair recognizes Council Flaherty, Chair of the Committee on Public Safety, Criminal Justice. Council Flaherty, you have the floor. Mr. President, and thanks to the clerk. It's going to make my job uh, much easier and shorter. We get uh, uh, six dockets uh, that we're uh, looking at. So these matters were sponsored by uh, Mayor Wu uh, and referred to committee on January the 26th. We held a public hearing Thursday, February 17th. Thank my colleagues for attending and for the great questions. Uh, we heard uh, testimony. I'm going to take 0159 and 0163 together for us. Those are the fire departments. Uh, Commissioner John Dempsey and Deputy Commissioner of Administration and Finance Kathleen Judge. Uh, come in to testify and uh, the safer program uh, in short it will be used to fund uh, a uh, recruit class of 85 uh, uh, for the boston fire department the commission reports that the grant is the largest grant in the country and will save our city over 24 million in the next three years with salary benefits for these new recruits and with respect to docket 0163 as uh, so um, uh, eloquently described uh, this obviously is to help our first responders over in the mass and cass area it will be a collaborative effort between the fire department, first responders, the mayor's office of recovery services, Boston Public Health Commission, Boston Police, to help improve response times to opioid overdose uh, calls um, and um, events. So uh, with that, uh, the chair is asking that both of those dockets uh, uh, pass. And it's again, it's year four of a four-year grant. With respect to the remaining uh, four uh, dockets, uh, docket 0161, um, that uh, Captain uh, Therese uh, Kazmiski and Lieutenant Richard Driscoll came in and testified uh, on behalf of the police department. This grant will improve Boston Police Department's capacity to respond to violent crimes and assist in the review, inventory, and follow-up investigations of up to 100 unsolved sexual assault cases that pose the most significant risk and threat to public safety. Uh, Docket 0162, um, with respect to the uh, emergency services best team, this grant is intended to support law enforcement behavioral health, cross-system collaboration, and to improve public safety responses and outcomes for individuals with mental health, illness, substance abuse, who also come in contact with the criminal justice system. With respect to docket 0164, uh, those funds will assist the crime laboratories to increase their capacity to process more DNA samples and to reduce the number of forensic DNA and DNA database samples awaiting analysis and or to prevent a backlog with respect to forensics and uh, DNA samples. And docket 0166, um, that grant uh, obviously targeting Jamaica Plain, East Boston, and Charlestown, uh, civilian uh, positions, civilian advocates working in partnership with BPD to help uh, provide victims of violent crime with protections and services uh, they need. And uh, so as a result of that, as chair of the Committee of Public Safety, I'm moving for passage of docket 0159, 0161, 0162, 0163, 0164, and 0166. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Flaherty. At this time, the at this time, the chair recognizes Councilor Edwards. Um, Councilor Edwards, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Just for my clarification, um, to the to the chair, Council Flaherty, we had hearings on every one of these. Correct. Thank you. Thank you, oh. Council Edwards. Anyone else um, want to talk before we um, vote on these? Any further discussion? Um, <clears throat> Council Flaherty, the chair on the Committee on Government Operations seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage. We'll do each, each one individually. The first one is docket 0159. All those in favor say aye. aye. Uh, all opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 0159 has passed. Council of Flaherty, the Chair of the Committee on Government, um, <coughs> Government Op the, ch the Chair on Public Safety, um, seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage of Docket 0161. All those in favor say aye. All opposed say nay. 
the ayes have it. 0161 has passed. Council of Flaherty, the Chair of the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice, uh, seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket 0162. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. The ayes have it. 0162 has passed. Council of Flaherty, the Chair of the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice seeks acceptance of the committee report passage of docket 0163. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. 0163 has passed. Council Flaherty, the Chair of the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice, uh, seeks acceptance and passage of the committee report passage of docket 0164. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, nay. The ayes have it. And finally, Council of Flaherty, the Chair of the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice, <coughs> seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket 0166. All those in, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. The ayes have it. 0166 <coughs> has passed. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0222. <coughs> Docket number 0222, the Committee on Government Operations to which was referred on February 2nd, 2022. Docket 0222. Message in order for your approval a home rule petition to the General Court entitled Petition for a Special Law Relative to an Act re an act Relative to Real Estate Transfer Fees and Senior Property Tax Relief. Submits a report recommending that the home rule petition ought to pass in a new draft. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The Chair recognizes Council Arroyo, Chair of the Committee on Government Operations. Council Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this docket was sponsored by the administration and referred to the committee on February 2nd, 2022. The committee held a hearing on February 10th uh, and a working session on February 25th. I want to thank all of my council colleagues uh, who attended the hearing and working session. It was, uh, and the entirety of the council actually attended. Uh, so that was Councillor Baker, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Louis Jen, Councillor Worrell, Councillor Murphy, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Bach, Councillor Laura, <laughs> Lara, Councillor Fernandez Anderson, and Councillor Braden. Uh, so thank you, all of you, uh, for your attention to this. I also want to thank Chief Dillon, Deputy Director Tim Davis, Commissioner Shea, and Neil Doherty for their attendance and participation. Uh, docket number 222 is a home rule petition that would authorize the City of Boston to impose a transfer fee to be paid on certain real estate, real estate transactions and expand the current senior property tax relief program. The transfer fee provisions would allow the city to impose a transfer fee of up to 2% on real estate sales over $2 million. Exempting the value of $2 million of the sale, revenue from the fee would be deposited in the Neighborhood Housing Trust, transfers between family members, transfers of convenience, and transfers to the government would be exempt. The city would outline specifics of the program through an ordinance which would come through this body for approval. The senior property tax relief provisions would adjust the income and asset limits for senior property tax relief eligibility. At the hearing, the administration testified that this home rule addresses uh, a fact that all counselors are aware of, which is that too many Boston residents are struggling with housing. 15,000 seniors in the city are paying more than 30% of their income for rent. 60,000 non-senior households are also rent burdened. Over 40,000 people are on the wait list for BHA housing. On any given night, there are 900 unhoused individuals in the city of Boston. And as of the last census data, 900 families living in the Boston family shelters. Uh, we know that for families to build wealth and stay in the city, they need to have access to affordable housing. And to expand affordable housing, we need increased revenue streams to do so. The proposed transfer fee will provide much needed revenue for affordable housing and housing stability programs. Based on 2021 sales, the fee would have affected 704 transactions across the city, the majority of which would have been in downtown neighborhoods and on high-priced condominiums, <coughs> as well as larger commercial transactions. The administration also highlighted how both components of the home rule proposal would help seniors in need of affordable housing or having trouble meeting their expenses. 74% of individuals and 44% of elder couples living independently in Boston have inco incomes below the elder index, meaning that they have less income than it costs them to live in the city. At the working session, the committee discussed various concerns, uh, including overlap with the pending state legislation, re-evaluations of the exempted value amount that amount for, account for inflation, and the extent of the amendability provision. Uh, the administration explained that despite potential overlap, the current proposal would provide Boston with the best remedies for its residents. Councilors also suggested the addition of language for flexibility to increase the exempted value with inflation and market values. Uh, though to be clear, the actual exemption amounts will be determined in an ordinance that will come through this body before uh, this ever gets implemented. 
Uh, regarding the amendability provision, the administration stated that given interest from multiple municipalities and the multi-year conversions on the topic of the transfer fee, giving the state maximum flexibility would increase the bill's chance of passage. The council expressed concerns about the broadness of the current language uh, regarding amendability, uh, and the chair suggested limiting this language slightly, even just to specify the objectives laid out in the bill itself. Uh, ultimately, based on information gathered at the hearing and the working session and follow-up with the administration, uh, that amendment was not taken up. Uh, the exempted value section was amended to change the evaluation period from five years to three years and also direct evaluations to happen. So to be clear, uh, Councillor Flaherty uh, and I believe Councillor Worrell, amongst others, raised the, uh, the exemption amount with inflation, with rising cost of inflation, uh, could, could catch folks in, in, the, in the web that it wasn't designed to do. Uh, and the amendment that we have in the amended version seeks to incorporate the amendments that they suggested uh, which are to change the language to ensure that those evaluations happen, to change the years from five years to three years. Uh, so the evaluations were supposed to happen every three years, every five years in the original draft, in this draft it's every three years. Uh, and so that's what's in the amended set to, uh, section. It's those amendments that were taken up. Uh, there was also a request uh, to, uh, to split essentially this into two parts, uh, one part for the seniors, uh, tax relief, another for the transfer fee that was also not taken up. Uh, passage of docket 0222 in its amended version will provide property tax relief to vulnerable senior residents and provide the city with the authority and maximum flexibility to impose a transfer fee on certain real estate, the revenue from which will contribute to much needed resources for affordable housing in the city of Boston. As the chair, I recommend that this, uh, this docket ought to pass in a new draft. And just again, to be clear, uh, the transfer tax itself will have to come, that transfer fee after we get approval from the House, after we get approval from the Senate, after the governor signs it, it will still have to come through this body uh, and be passed by this body. Uh, the senior tax relief, uh, that will actually get implemented immediately. Uh, and so once that gets signed, that is, that is law. And, and so, uh, Mr. President, I am seeking uh, a vote uh, and passage in a new draft. Thank you. Thank you, Council Arroyo. Any of my colleagues like to discuss the matter? At this time, I'm going to recognize, um, she recognizes Council of Flaherty. Council of Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and obviously want to thank the uh, Chair. Um, I was having uh, connectivity issues, and uh, he, um, I don't know how he was able to do it, but masterfully was able to decipher what I was actually saying and then to, uh, you know, accurately, um, you know, uh, report those questions back to the panel. So I appreciate uh, his effort as I was struggling with, uh, with uh, the Internet. Uh, and also thank uh, the, one of the lead sponsors and, uh, and been a leader on this body with respect to affordable housing uh, prior to her tenure here, but also while here. And uh, this petition, I feel, is stronger uh, than previous petitions that we've sent up to Beacon Hill because it does more to ensure that uh, we're not unintentionally targeting uh, middle class uh, property owners uh, with that two million exemption, as well as, and I appreciate the indulgence of the lead sponsors and the chairs to, to work with the administration on um, on having that reevaluation done uh, every three years just to make sure, again, we're not sort of catching, um, unintentionally catching folks in, in that web if this is targeting sort of the flippers, um, you know, the residential and the commercial flippers that we want to make sure that uh, lifelong residents and uh, long-term property owners, uh, those that I consider to be, as you say, um, house rich but cash poor. Uh, many of the folks that we know, they're fixed income seniors that have owned their own property, they're retired and they continue to see things happening around their neighborhood, which they're not necessarily participating in, but every time that tax bill comes in, they're paying a price for that, um, despite the fact that they've owned their property, they've kept their property up, uh, and they're being valued uh, and evaluated based on what's sort of happening on that street or around the corner. So this will just sort of maybe bake in some protections uh, for them. It's also an improvement because the senior property tax relief that changes uh, Section 41C that uh, both uh, the chair and uh, Councilor Lydia Edwards had described uh, in detail because we have seniors in every neighborhood, every corner of the city that are burdened and overburdened by the increased property taxes. Um, I also briefly want to touch on the ongoing discussion about the Neighborhood Housing Trust ability to efficiently receive and distribute the influx of, of funding. Uh, this was a discussion that we've had multiple times on this body, probably most recently is uh, 2019. Uh, with an earlier version, and then we had passed it again in 2022. So if this were to pass at the State House, it's critical for us to be very prospective uh, via the ordinance uh, with the distribution and use of these funds. You know, I've often suggested that, you know, we have an affordable housing crisis uh, line item. We should have a line item uh, in our budget. 
uh, and that uh, so that we, as elected members on behalf of residents, could more readily and easily access those so that we could uh, target um, those affordable housing crisis needs in our city. I also want to echo some of the comments that uh, our colleague, Council Baker, had mentioned during the hearing. Uh, specifically, um, you know, that's the most pressing issue facing uh, our city, and yet the resources we continue to throw at it each year, it's still extremely difficult for all of us to help get people placed uh, in housing and to secure affordable housing via the IDP lottery. Um, it still remains to some a mystery. So. Uh, we need to continue to double down on our efforts to streamline that process. And when you know someone in your district um, that is in need of affordable housing or a unit, we as their elected representatives, district or at large council, we should be you know, a conduit. We should be able to run out the ground ball for that person to get them into a housing. So I, I know that D&D uh, that &D and our affordable housing team, they do great work. And it's truly a labor of love for, for many of our city employees, particularly those that are on the front lines for affordable housing. But I, I do want to stress that it's important that we allocate precious funding towards the highest and best use for affordable housing initiatives and really gives long thought to targeting shovel-ready projects so that that money that once it becomes available can go right to work uh, and put someone in a home and get a roof over their head and that we as uh, their representatives can advocate on their behalf and help them facilitate an affordable housing unit. Thank you, Mr. President. Look forward to, uh, to supporting. Thank you, Council Flaherty. The, the Chair recognizes District Council, Council Baker, Council Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Just a, a couple comments. I will be voting no on this today based on, based on the fact that I think the, the senior benefit should be separated out of, out of this. So, so when we do send it to the State House, they're voting on just a senior benefit. This is something we should be doing already. Shouldn't be attached to a tax. The problem I have with the tax with, the, with, with, with this coming in here is somewhat Council Flaherty had to say, if this were much more prescriptive, if we were in year one going to build a West End library with 100 apartments above it and all the money was going to go towards that, I'm in. If we were going to go into District 4 and some of our city land that we own, we were going to build 40 unit, 40 unit buildings there, 20 unit buildings there, the money being directly directed right there, large pieces of money, not a million dollars here to, to a connected development, a million dollars here to a connected program or, 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 or um, 501C. I think it needs, we need to start taking um, larger pieces of our money, whether it's IDP, whether it's job, job uh, not job trust, housing trust money, and putting the amounts of 10, 20 million into building our own infrastructure. Again, just the way the money gets cut up and sent, spreads the infield, I don't find it to be an effective, effective model. And then the third point is, we can't get our own people in these units that are getting built. Good luck trying to find an apartment for somebody when we know they're getting built all over the place. No, you're 800th on the list, you've been on the list for 10 years, can't get you in. So there's a problem there someplace. I'd like the city to start actually owning the buildings that we're building, using our money and building infrastructure instead of just giving it to, develop, to developers. Because a lot of the money that's made in affordable housing is made in um, building fees. That's how, that's how the people that are building these are making the money. And then, and, then it gets, and then it gets managed to, we have to do lotteries and everything else to get our people in. So I hope I didn't, I made some sense there, but thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> thank you, Council Baker. <clears throat> The Chair recognizes um, District Councilor Kendra Lara, and this will not be Councilor Lara's maiden speech. Um, Councilor Lara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. Uh, as the Chair of the Housing and Community Development Committee and as the City Councilor representing District 6, I just want to reiterate my support for this home rule petition. District 6 has one of the highest concentrations of seniors in the city, and in addition, our neighborhood in the past decade has seen an increase of displacement, lack of affordability, and gentrification, uh, which has made affordable housing that much more important. Um, it's for that reason that I think it's not only important that we pass the transfer fee, but also the expansion of 41C um, together. And so I ask that the council not bifurcate those two, um, but keep them collective at this moment. Thank, thank you, Council Lara. Anyone else like to speak on this matter? <clears throat> uh, thank you, Council Arroyo, the chair on the committee. The chair on the Committee of Government Operations seeks acceptance of the committee report in passage of docket 0222 
in a new draft. Let, let me um, call on Council Buck. Um, would you like to speak before we do the vote, Council Buck? this and think we need uh, more resources for affordable housing um, of all types all over the city and that it's a very, very urgent thing. I actually wanted to um, thank Councillor Flynn. I think that the um, the hearings that and working sessions that we had on senior property tax relief last year at his behest because of hearing orders that he filed um, really allowed the administration to start getting into the weeds of 41C and so I think the ability for the um, administration to add that piece to this and, and combine the two really came out of that conversation we had in Ways and Means last year. So just wanted to um, acknowledge that I think this is a proposal that has uh, been worked through with, by some really good council work, both uh, by Councillor Flynn and our committee, and then also, of course, by uh, Councillor Edwards and, and some of our um, predecessors on the council. So just wanted to thank everybody for all the work uh, of the council in partnership with the mayor to get to this point. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Block, and apologize for not calling on you sooner. Um, so, Councillor Arroyo, the chair on the Committee on Government Operations, seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage of Docket 0222 in a new draft. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. Um, Mr. Kirk, um, will you please do a roll call vote? Roll call vote on docket 0222. Two, two. Councilor Arroyo? Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker? Nay. Councilor Baker, no. Councilor Bach? Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden? Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Edwards? Yes. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson? Yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, yes. Councilor Flaherty? Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn? Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Lara? Yes. Councilor Lara, yes. Councilor Louis Jen? Councilor Louis Jen, yes. Councilor Mejia. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Murphy, yes. And Councilor Worrell. Yes. Councilor Worrell, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Um, docket 0222 has passed. Motions, orders, and resolutions. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0321. Docket number 0321, Councillor Edwards offered the following. Petition for a special law, re-securing environmental justice in the city of Boston. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. I know Councillor Edwards will move to substitute the updated draft, um, and central staff already distributed the new draft. Um, at this time, I call on City Councillor Edwards. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I'm very excited to bring this uh, to the floor for us to, to introduce this new home rule petition. Uh, at the end of the day, it is dealing with our constitutional rights, our recent defined rights as for environmental justice, and also making sure that our zoning is in line with those rights. I want to be, I don't know if anyone else has read the Constitution and our constitutional rights in Massachusetts, but Article 97 states very clearly, the people shall have the right to clean air and water freedom from excessive unnecessary noise, the natural, scenic, historic, and aesthetic qualities of their environment, and the protection of the people in their right to conservation, development and utilization of the agricultural, mineral, forest, water, air, and other natural resources is hereby declared to be a public purpose. So in our own constitution, we have the right to clean air and water. Moreover, and, and part of that conversation continued as of last year, when we defined environmental justice principles in our general laws, those principles being that the pe uh, that people in the Commonwealth shall have protection from environmental pollution and the ability to live in and enjoy a clean, healthy environment, regardless of race, color, income, class, handicap, gender, identity, sexual orientation, national origin, ethnicity or ancestry, religious belief or English language proficiency. And those principles include the meaningful involvement of all people with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies, including climate change policies. And of course, the equitable distribution of energy and environmental benefits and environmental burdens. Our laws are very clear about our rights and the procedures that are to protect us. We are moving towards a more environmentally just state 
But what isn't moving towards that is our zoning. And as many of you will know, and some of you new counselors will soon learn, Boston is unique when it comes to zoning. When we want to change how we do business and how we build in the city of Boston, when we want to change who's on the Zoning Board of Appeals, we, and only the city of Boston, must go to the State House. That is why this is in the form of a home rule petition. Other cities and towns could easily inject and move environmental justice principles in their zoning with the snap of a finger. We must go to the State House because our system is broken. Article six, or Section 6 of our zoning code currently allows the following. A building structure or land used to be land used or to be used by a public service corporation, utility company, may be exempted from the operation of zoning regulation or amendment if upon petition of the corporation, the State Department of Public Utilities shall, after public notice and hearing, decide that the present or proposed situation of the building, structure, or land in question is reasonably necessary for the convenience of public welfare. In short, public utilities can simply petition the Department or the, uh, Public Utilities to forego our zoning. And as long as the State Department of Public Utilities decides that it's best for Boston and our public welfare that they forego and go through any process, our zoning, they can. Which brings to me to this reason why I'm presenting this today. The East Boston substation is a perfect example of what happens when you can petition the state to determine what is better for a neighborhood and not actually have to face the individuals who will live with that permanent structure by their park, by their homes, when the city of Boston essentially abdicated their role because the utility company could simply ask to forego us. So I'm asking you to support this home rule petition because it corrects that system. That system we've been asking for and we saw it was broken. We had a five hour hearing in East Boston in many languages. We watched how the DPU and the state agencies literally didn't include people who didn't speak English in the process for the substation. We, as you all know, have a mandate as public officials. That mandate on November 2nd made clear in every single one of our districts and of course at the city at large that that substation does not belong where it currently is situated and needs to go to another location. More importantly, the process that got it there was a failure. And as you know, question two is the most popular uh, referendum we've ever had in the city of Boston, getting more votes than the mayor and of course any individual one of us in our districts. The time to act is now. And what I propose is this home rule petition that would do three things. One, for the first time, it would allow for us, at the city of Boston, to take from the state this power that they have over us. And allows for us, at the city of Boston, to come up with a process for, for public utilities if they want to be sited in our neighborhood. It then tells, them, tells us, that it, or tells the city of Boston that the Boston Zoning Commission will come up with that alternative process. We will not be going to the State House anymore to forego our zoning. We will create it ourselves for public utilities and to make sure that they can move as fast as they need to, but according to our terms. And then, ultimately, it injects environmental justice as one of the enforcement powers of our building commission. Commissioner, excuse me. That person already can stop a project because it's not safe, because it's not sanitary, and now because it's environmentally unjust. I want the building commissioner to be able to walk into a project and determine based off of certain standards that the environmental justice um, is being so violated that it cannot continue to operate and cannot continue to build. Basically adding to the police powers of the city of Boston for our safety and for our lungs that are guaranteed to us under our Constitution, as I mentioned when I opened, the right to clean air, the right to clean uh, water, and essentially the right to live in a healthy environment. I'm hoping that you will join me and sign on today to this home rule petition. I look forward to an expedited or close to hearing before I leave this body, and I look forward to catching this home rule on the other side, the Beacon Hill. You have to know that environmental uh, advocates are excited about this conversation. And the amended version, I just wanted to note, the only amendment was put in to make sure that our waterfront was also part of the enforcement protection from the building commissioner. Ultimately, 
this is where we need to go. This is where we are going as a state, as a country. We need our zoning to be updated to include environmental justice standards and to protect our neighborhoods. And I hope you'll join me in doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Council Edwards. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Would anyone else like to, yeah? Okay. The Chair recognizes um, Council Flaherty. Council Flaherty, you have the floor. Mr. President, I just want to obviously commend our colleague for her work on this and through the Chair to her. I want to see whether or not there's an opportunity with existing sites that are not good neighbors and have been polluting. Uh, is there a way through this legislation to maybe kind of um, hook back onto those and work with, uh, you know, obviously the city officials, et cetera, to maybe talk about either uh, moving them or uh, and finding more appropriate locations or are they, I guess, technically grandfathered? So I, I would, because uh, obviously I'm uh, supportive of our colleague and her efforts uh, in East Boston, but we can go across the city and you sit there and you say, how did that happen and why is that there? And I heard about this. So um, is there a way through this legislation that we'll be able to kind of go back in time and identify sites that are inappropriate in those particular locations and then work with those entities to maybe move them to more appropriate locations? Again, just a question through the chair to, to the maker. Council Edwards. Thank you very much. Um, as the standards for sanitation grow, as the standards and enforcement standards grow on any other aspect of which the building commissioner can enforce our zoning laws, then they would have the same standards and the ability to grow and stop work on existing environmental injustices. So it isn't just that we don't like something. And I want to be very clear, this isn't a NIMBY move to stop infrastructure. We do need and need to talk about how we are building for our electrical grid. There is no doubt at some point we will need versions of substations in all neighborhoods. The issue with this one was the process, that there wasn't uh, an actual open assessment of the data used by Eversource, the fact that we weren't allowed to question it, and moreover, the fact that they didn't even think of green alternatives. And that would have happened, I believe, and we can zone that and require that to happen going forward. But with the building commissioner's police enforcement um, powers, if there's an active environmental injustice, they should be under this law, able to stop it. To move it, well, that might be something you might want to put in a friend friendly amendment in the future. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you, Council Edwards. Thank you, Council Flaherty. Anyone else like to speak on this or add your name? Um, Mr. Clerk, please add Councilor Arroyo, Councilor Bach, Councilor Braden, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, Council Flaherty, Council Lara, Council Lujan. Council Murphy, Council Rell, please add, add the chair. Um, docket 0321 will be referred to the Committee on Government Operations. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0322, please. Docket number 0322, Councilor Murphy offered the following Home Rule Petition to Address Public Health Reform. The Chair recognizes Councilor Murphy. Uh, Council Murphy, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. We, as the Boston City Council, are tasked with making very impactful decisions for the residents of the City of Boston. As an at-large City Councilor, I am contacted by hundreds and hundreds of constituents with questions and concerns on a wide range of topics. In the three months I've been in office, I have helped a witness to a homicide find safe shelter after she showed up in my office and stayed with me for over five hours until we could make sure her and her young son were safe. I advocated that our Boston Public School children had the opportunity to get back to playing sports and participating in extracurricular activities safely like their peers in Metco, private, and parochial schools were doing. I knew that this was critical for the mental health and well-being of our BPS children, so I was willing to do my research and take a stand. I rallied with the Tufts nurses, staff, and families when the hospital announced they were closing Floating Hospital for Children in Chinatown. My three youngest children were born there, and my son Colin spent most of his short life in the intensive care unit there. Advocating for our health care workers and residents in Chinatown, who rely on this hospital is important to do. I continue to visit all of the departments in City Hall so I can introduce myself and get to know what they do and how I can be an ally to them as they keep this city moving forward. I keep showing up to learn more and help 
but for me to do my job effectively, I need to have all the information there is so I can feel confident in my understanding of the topics and informed decisions that we have to make. We all know that these are big decisions that we make here on the City Council. In my Home Rule petition, I am calling on the Boston Public Health Act of 1995 be reformed so we can build more transparency and accountability. Why, during a global pandemic and a state of emergency that we have been in for two years, has the board only met a handful of times in the information they have and the decisions that have been, they have been making has not been communicated to us on the council in an effective and consistent way? Why, even last night after the board met in private to discuss COVID mandates, did I find out they decided to lift the mask mandate by someone texting me a screenshot of a Twitter post. I was getting calls about it from constituents and I had no answers for them. In my home room peti petition, docket 322, I am asking that the board meets monthly in ordinary times and weekly in public during a declared state of emergency and that they submit a weekly update as to the state of public health in the city of Boston. These are just some of the proposals I have made in my petition, and I look forward to working with my colleagues in our hearings and working sessions to bring our collective knowledge to the table and draft a meaningful petition that will bring transparency and accountability to the Boston Public Health Commission. I thank you. Thank you, Councilor Murphy. Um, would anyone else like to speak on this matter? The the Chair recognizes uh, District Council Baker. Council Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. And um, thank you, Council Murphy, for the hearing you had the other day. We had a, a lot of information came in there. Um, <clears throat> our Board of Health is the first Board of Health in the country. The first, the first um, head of that board was Paul Revere. So to put it into perspective, the person that was fighting for us 250 years old for us to have rights was on this board here. And he, vo and he was fighting for our health 250 years ago. We need to continue that fight. I would like to read for you, if you can just sit with me for a section, chapter 111 of state law, section 30. Boards of health may appoint agents or directors of public health to act for them in cases of emergency or if they cannot conveniently assemble. And any such agent or director shall have all the authority which the board appointing him to have. But he or she shall in each case within two days report his action or her action to the board for its approval and shall be directly responsible to it in under, in under its direction and control. An agent or director of public health appointed to make sanitary inspections may make complaints or violations of any law, ordinance, or bylaw relative to public health. So when there's an action taken, you have two days to go to the board and get approval. So I would say on December 20th, there was an action taken. There was a document signed, and there was no approval by our board, which was founded by people like Paul Revere. So, just food for thought, people. Aaron, thank you. Thank you for this. We need to be in this discussion here. We shouldn't all be in the, in, in the dock here. Just trying to shine some light on it. Thank you. And Aaron, again, thank you for the, for the hearing we had the other day. It, it sort of laid out a good story for me. What I, one thing that I didn't know is that Mayor Wu actually signed an agreement with the, um, with the, uh, superior officers on December 7th, an agreement saying that testing was okay. That's in addition to the, the agreement that was signed by Mayor Janie before her. Now, I'm glad the mask mandate is being dropped, but that was the least of our problems there. We still have people that are going to lose jobs, and it's just not cops and firefighters. It's people collecting tickets. It's people in public works. It's our, it's our custodians. It's a lot of people. And we have about a 97% um, vaccination rate now, I think we're doing pretty good. So just some background. Thank you, Mr. President, for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Councilor Baker. Would anyone else like to speak in this matter? The chair recognizes 
At large, Councilor Michael Flaherty. Council Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, thank the lead sponsor for, for filing this. I uh, was at that hearing. I, I almost fell off the chair when I learned that the uh, Public Health Commission only met uh, every other month throughout the entire pandemic. A pandemic, uh, the likes of which we've never seen in our lifetime, a uh, major public health uh, crisis, an emergency, um, and uh, the folks that are, I guess, responsible for sort of overseeing uh, decisions in that realm um, didn't see fit to meet more often than every other month. I, I, it was incredulous to me, and it was also, um, it was um, a, a ton of adjectives, I guess, come to mind, but um, uh, I can say this, and let me be perfectly clear on this one. There are some very competent, capable folks on that commission. They're running hospitals. They're running community health centers. Clearly, they were in a lane doing great work, so I don't want to I don't want to dismiss that, uh, but they also had a responsibility uh, to to this uh, commission and to us as elected leaders and to the residents that we represent. We met every day for the newer members. Uh, we met every day, every morning. We were on a call. Every, we all know it. Everybody was on a call, um, and uh, and we were uh, giving information, getting information, and I don't necessarily put myself in the I guess the the, the healthcare skill set, but. We were there, advocating on behalf of our residents, advocating on behalf of our constituents. Uh, fortunately, obviously, we had a mayor with two hands on his wheel, and also uh, our public health folks, our housing folks, uh, everyone. It was a full, full court press, all hands on deck. But, but our Boston Public Health Commission, they met every other month. Does that, does that make any sense? Does that seem, does that seem like? Does that seem fair? It seem right? It seem, so I think the time has come to at least evaluate uh, sort of who's on it, what's on it. And in the event that you know, there's a public health crisis and if we got someone running a health center, we got someone running a hospital, maybe they have a designee, maybe it's their COO, maybe it's their CFO, maybe it's their general counsel. Uh, somebody uh, needs to be there. And then I think during the course of the pandemic, somebody in that sphere was, uh, was, was uh, phoning in from, from, uh, from Hawaii. Pandemic. We had a pandemic, and our public health commission at best met every other month. I got a problem with that, and I think that we, as a body, uh, we need to get those answers. We need to find out sort of what the methodology was behind that. And if I was a hey, I was running a health center. Hey, I was running a hospital. I didn't have any time. I, I, I can understand that because again, when you look at the makeup of the of the body, capable, uh, committed, dedicated. Uh, professionals are on that are on that commission, but how in God's name they didn't think that hey, uh, like we got to we got to meet more often than every other month. We got to get some information. We got to be out front of this thing. Um, and instead, it was you know we had obviously a Chief Martinez. I don't think the guy slept. I mean, can you imagine? Imagine if we only we could only meet with Chief Martinez every other month, or he was on the call maybe every other week. He was on that call every single morning with us. We were on that call. For months, and I guess no one, no one over the Boston Public Health Commission thought that they should meet more than every other month. I, I just, I, the words I can't even describe, sort of uh, the frustration, the anger that I have. So I think we should have a, a hearing immediately. I think if this is a self-respecting body, particularly if we're approving commissioners, if we're um, whether they're for appointment or reappointment, um, you know, we need to let them know, like I guess, who we are and the role that we play in city government and how attentive we are when things are happening. And we expect the same of them. We expect the same of the Zoning Commission, the Zoning Board of Appeals, uh, Housing Commission that we approved today. There's a level of sort of, uh, of commitment, I think, that we've come to expect as, you know, as, as Bostonians. And, uh, and I, frankly, I don't know if they, they answered the bell during a pandemic. And again, this doesn't speak to their professional qualifications. Highly capable, uh, committed, dedicated folks are on that board doing great things for our city. But with respect to their responsibility to the Public Health Commission, I think they mailed it in. And I think they, be, they need to be called out on it. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you, Council Flaherty. I'd like to recognize um, Councilor Kenzie Bach, District Councilor Kenzie Bach. You have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. President. I wasn't intending to speak on this matter, but I just want to put on the record on the floor that I think that our Boston Public Health Commissioners and the Commission has done exceptional work during this pandemic. Um, I think that this body knows well that a great deal of work happens outside of just hearings and meetings. 
I think that none of us as counselors would want people to only count when we are standing on the floor of this body as the work that we do on behalf of the public. And I think that in addition to Chief Martinez, people throughout the commission and on the commission board were working tirelessly and without sleep, and we saw them. And I just want to stress that to me, the reason that we have emergency public health powers is because the, the, po the politicians need to have experts, professionals in the space when we're in a public health emergency. And there, yes, needs to be a little bit of distance between the political decision makers and those public health professionals, especially when we've got data changing every hour as we have throughout this. So I, I just really want to stress, I, I am all for good government and thinking about what are our structures of accountability, but I also think that we should have the humility as a council to recognize the fact that there is some space that is created in that intentionally. I also want to note that we have a specific chapter, as Councillor Murphy acknowledges in her home rule petition about the Boston Public Health Commission, so the general chapter about public health commissions around the state um, is not the one that we're working with in the case of Boston. But you know, I think that the the proof is in the pudding, I think, that a bunch of really professional, thoughtful people have, have helped us through this crisis. And although I think those daily calls that the council were on were very informative for us in the early months of the pandemic, they were mainly calls of information in which the council was hearing about what was happening. But a lot of people in this professional public health space were actually making decisions and sifting through the numbers. And so I just really would not want us to let this docket go by in this moment on this floor without acknowledging the tremendous sacrifice and work of those professionals on RPF over the past two years. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you, Council Bach. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Would anyone else? Um, the, the chair recognizes District City Council, Council Royo. Council Royo, give the floor. Thank you, Councilor President uh, Flynn. Uh, I just want to uh, echo what Councillor Bach said. Uh, I was the chair of public health for those, those two years, uh, and I did have multiple conversations with members of that actual board when it came to standing up vaccination sites, when it came to standing up testing sites. Uh, many of them are health professionals who were in the thick of it, uh, who were uh, frankly doing the work that we were being informed about on those calls. Uh, and so uh, the reality is uh, the members of that board uh, do tremendous work. I, I, I echo the concern about politicizing our health board uh, in, in a way that could be uh, disruptive to the actual public health. I, I'm all for accountability. Nobody is above accountability or oversight. But I do want to make sure we do not politicize the Boston Public Health Commission or the Boston Public Health Board, uh, whose focus should be on the health uh, and wellness of our communities, uh, of standing up the kinds of programming and standing up the kinds of uh, policy and work that we require, uh, and I know that much of this frustration uh, that I have seen, that I have received, is around mask mandates and vaccine mandates and things of that nature, and the idea that they have not chimed in the way that other health boards have. Uh, but I think in the work that matters, the work uh, that has impacted lives in terms of making sure that we are getting vaccines into people's arms, making sure that we are standing up testing, making sure that we are keeping people alive, uh, they have been exceptional at the work they have done. And I would just note that it was the Boston Public Health Commission's work that allowed for me to have the data and to have the studies uh, on racism as a public health crisis, they had already done that work. And so uh, laying out the blueprint or laying out the, the problem was, was made possible because of the work that they had done. And so I just want to commend them uh, and not really call them out as much as we call them in into ways in which we can do a better process uh, moving forward for, for those things. And I would just note that yesterday's meeting was public, it was noticed, and it was available on Zoom. And I know that because I was present at that meeting. Uh, and so uh, I, I just think that there's ways to do this. Perhaps we change the, the amount of times it required to meet, but I will just note that they have not been absent at the wheel. They have not been uh, you know, phoning this in. So uh, thank you, Council President Flynn. Uh, thank you, Councilor Bach, for, for standing up and speaking. Uh, and I appreciate uh, the discourse. Thank you, Council Royal. The chair recognizes Council Baker. Council Baker, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. M uh, Mr. President. Um, we're talking about politicizing a board. I'm talking about a decision that was made purely political, and the board, they did an end around on the board. The board wasn't involved, is what I'm getting at. This was a political decision. This was a decision that was made on the 20th, 
and should have at least had some action by our board if we were going deeper into a, a, an emergency situation. It was all political, and that's and that's my problem. I'm not looking. I'm not looking to call out the board or call in the board. I just want, when in moving forward, if we're going to strip people's rights, if we're going to tell, if we're going to tell business owners that they can't conduct a business a certain way, if we're going to lay people off their jobs, separate them from their service in the city of Boston, then we should at least have a discussion around it. There was zero discussion here. It's got nothing to do with the. It, no, I shouldn't say it's got nothing to do with the board. It should have been. If the decision was going to happen over there, there should have been a discussion with the health board, and that decision is not on the health board. That decision was more across the hall. Thank you. Thank you, Council Baker. Anyone else like to speak on this? Um, the chair recognizes at large Councilor, Councilor Murphy. Council Murphy, you have the floor. Sure, thank you. I just want to clarify and thank you, Councilor Arroyo. When I said private, I did mean, because I met with the chief of staff earlier that day, that there was no space on the agenda for any public questioning. So in that case, I mean, you could chime in, like you could listen, which we all know we can listen to. And there was no report out after to us as a council that this was, that the mandate was on the agenda and changed. So just to clarify, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Murphy. Would anyone else like to speak or add their name? Um, if you'd like to add your name, please raise your hand. Please add Councillor Baker. Please add Councillor Flaherty. Please add the chair. Docket 0322 will be referred to the Committee on Government Operations. Mr. Clerk, please, call, please read Docket 0323. Docket number 0323, Councilor Lara offered the following. Order for a hearing to discuss restoring municipal voting rights to immigrants with legal status. The Chair recognizes Councilor Lara. Councilor Lara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. Uh, given the nature of my hearing order, I will be uh, delivering uh, my speech uh, first in Spanish and then in English. En los Estados Unidos, creemos en un gobierno del pueblo, por el pueblo y para el pueblo. Pero en lugar de acercarnos a una democracia más completa y representativa, nosotros, el pueblo, se ha definido de manera limitada. Se ha utilizado para promover los intereses de la clase dominante y negar a los derechos civiles a las comunidades que son históricamente marginadas. En Boston, más de 40,000 inmigrantes están privados de sus derechos por nuestras leyes electorales. Desafortunadamente, la exclusión del de proverbial nosotros no es exclusiva a las comunidades de inmigrantes. No damos voz a los jóvenes en las elecciones de sus representantes. Las personas que están encarceladas son despojadas de su acceso a la boleta. Y nuestra falta de voluntad para implementar leyes de sentido común disuade a nuestros electores de participar en el proceso electoral. Si queremos crear un gobierno municipal verdaderamente representativo, debemos comprometernos a ampliar el electorado, profundizar nuestra definición de la democracia y, en última instancia, llevar al centro a los marginados. Cada lugar donde vemos nuestros vecinos excluidos del poder nos ofrece una oportunidad única para abordar las barreras y construir una democracia social más fuerte. Por supuesto, podemos comenzar a expandir el electorado, reduciendo la edad para votar, otorgando derechos a los inmigrantes y colocando una urna en cada cárcel. Pero el proceso democrático no termina, ni debe terminar, después que se emite un voto. Nosotros el pueblo, todo el pueblo, deberíamos tener el poder no solo para elegir a nuestros representantes, sino para participar plenamente en cada decisión, discusión y deliberación que impacta nuestra vida diaria. Nosotros el pueblo, 
Podemos reorganizar nuestros valores y poner a las personas por encima de las ganancias. Proteger a los trabajadores, democratizar los lugares de trabajo y garantizar medios de vida sostenibles para que nuestras familias puedan prosperar. Nosotros el pueblo. Podemos eliminar la amenaza de desplazamiento, ampliar las viviendas controladas por la comunidad y construir más viviendas sociales para apoyar los sindicatos de inquilinos. Nosotros, el pueblo, podemos centrar la soberanía indígena e implementar regulaciones ambientales que mantengan a las comunidades más vulnerables de Boston resilientes frente al cambio climático y en el centro de la toma de decisiones. Nosotros, el pueblo, podemos avanzar para restaurar los derechos de voto municipales para los inmigrantes y acercarnos un paso más a nuestra visión de una democracia social transformativa, donde el proceso, el proceso democrático comienza en las urnas y se expande más allá de los muros del gobierno local, en cada lugar de trabajo, hogar y escuela. Para que las clases trabajadoras que hacen nuestro país, nuestro estado y nuestra ciudad lo que es hoy, tengan el poder de autodeterminar colectivamente su futuro. Porque la democracia no viene de arriba, viene de abajo. No reverbera desde el centro, sino que se hace hecho hacia adentro, desde los márgenes más lejanos. Thank you, President Flynn. And good afternoon to all of my colleagues on the City Council, the staff and constituents who are present in attendance here today. Let me begin by expressing my deep gratitude to the people of District 6. Thank you. It's my honor to serve as a steward of our collective vision here at City Hall. The first time that I stepped foot in the Ayanela Chamber, I wasn't a city councilor. I was 13 years old, standing in the gallery, attending my first protest. At the time, I couldn't imagine that I would be here with you today. I'm humbled to be the first person of color to represent my district and to have earned the trust of such a diverse coalition of people. But the path from the margins to the center was not an easy one. The campaign trail was long and filled with pointed reminders that women like me belonged on the outside. Still, the electoral process pulls us in. It activates our neighborhoods. It ignites conversation and debate. It allows us to hear our neighbors' most challenging concerns and revel in their most transformative visions for a more inclusive city. One of the unexpected joys of the campaign trail was running into other candidates' loved ones. We all know that our family members are our best surrogates. And there's a special pride in a parent's face when they ask you to vote for their child. I talked about public safety with John Spillane's dad in West Roxbury. I ate freshly baked cookies with David Halbert's mom in JP. And when I met Bridget Nee Walsh's childhood friend at Holy Name, she did not hesitate to pull out the photos of them growing up together in South Boston. They couldn't wait to fill in that bubble next to their loved ones' names. My own father stood outside Doris Bunty Apartments in Eggleston Square from 7 in the morning to 7 in the evening every election day. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> He canvassed his entire building, stringing together the few English words that he knew, and handed out literature to anybody who would take it, convincing them, thank you. <laughs> convincing them to cast their vote for his daughter. And yet, despite all his hard work, his pride in seeing my name in yard signs all across the district, He never had the chance to see my name on the ballot. My father, a 30-year resident of the city, could not vote for his youngest daughter.
In the U.S., we believe in a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. But instead of bringing us closer to a more complete, more representative democracy, we the people has been narrowly defined, used to further the ruling class interest and deny civil rights to historically marginalized communities. In Boston alone, 40,000 immigrants are disenfranchised by our current voting laws. Unfortunately, exclusion from the proverbial we isn't unique to immigrant communities. We don't give young people a voice in choosing their representatives. People who are incarcerated are stripped of their access to the ballot. And our unwillingness to implement common sense policies like same day registration deter our constituents from participating in the electoral process. If we want to create a truly representative municipal government, we must commit to expanding the electorate deepening our definition of democracy, and ultimately bringing those in the margins to the center. Every place that we see our neighbors excluded from power offer us a unique opportunity to address barriers and to build a stronger social democracy. Of course, we can start by expanding the electorate, lowering the voting age, enfranchising immigrants, and putting a ballot box in every jail, but ultimately, the democratic process doesn't and shouldn't end after a vote is cast. We the people, all the people, should have the power, not just to elect our representatives, but to fully participate in every decision, discussion, and deliberation that impacts our daily lives. Excuse me. We the people can rearrange our values and put people over profit protect workers, democratize workplaces, and guarantee sustainable livelihoods so that our families can thrive. We, the people, can eliminate the threat of displacement, expand community-controlled land trust, build more social housing, and support tenant unions. We, the people, can center indigenous sovereignty and implement environmental protections that keep Boston's most vulnerable communities resilient in the face of climate change. We, the people, can move to restore municipal voting rights for immigrants and get one step closer to our vision of a transformative social democracy, one where the democratic process starts at the ballot but expands beyond the walls of local government into every workplace, home, and school, so that the working class people who make our country, our state, and our city what it is today have the power to collectively self-determine their future. Because democracy does not come from the top. It comes from the bottom. It doesn't reverberate out from the center, but instead, it echoes inwards from the farthest of the margins. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lara. It was excellent. Excellent speech, maiden speech. We're very inspired by those words. Um, would anyone else like to add their name to docket 0323 or to speak on the matter? Would anyone like to speak on the matter, I should say, first? Um, the council recognizes um, District City Council uh, Ricardo Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. Uh, I just want to commend uh, Councilor Lara on a beautiful maiden speech and for making the very first thing that you do on the council uh, move to enfranchise uh, more members and residents of our communities uh, and to have more voices that are often unheard uh, brought into this space and into this chamber. So I uh, deeply appreciate that. Uh, I also want to say that this is uh, great. Uh, that you are moving forward on this. This is something that we've seen 
uh, in different iterations. I know my father presented this in 2000, I think it was six or seven, and we got very close. Uh, it, it failed seven, seven to six, uh, so it was very close. Uh, and then uh, Councillor Campbell also brought this forward as something to explore, and I think we've seen this now in many, many cities, most recently in New York. Uh, and I, I think it's important to note for folks uh, who often say, you know, become a citizen, this is the entire incentive. Uh, many residents, many legal residents have been trying to become citizens for decades. Uh, the process in this country is essentially broken. It's something that uh, is not a surprise to many uh, in terms of a conversation. That's not something that is a shocking statement to say that our process for legalization uh, and for uh, citizenship is a broken process. Uh, many people have debated the system on this for decades. Uh, but frankly, you can have people who are in that process for 20, 30 years on, uh, and those are folks that are paying taxes, those are folks who are sending their kids to our schools, those are folks who are uh, participating in all the other ways in which our communities uh, impact their lives and deserve a voice uh, in how and, and the way in those decisions are made. Uh, and so I look forward to this hearing. I commend you for having the courage uh, and the foresight to, to put this on the floor. Uh, and I look forward to uh, attending and participating in this hearing whenever it is set. So thank you, uh, President uh, Flynn. Thank you, uh, Councilor Lara. And please add my name. Thank you, Council Arroyo. The chair recognizes District City Councilor Kenzie Block. Council Block, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. President. I also want to um, thank Councilor Lara for such a wonderful maiden speech um, and to uh, ask you to add my name, Mr. President, and just uh, say that it has my full, full and strong support. I think I, um, as some folks know, lived abroad for a few years in uh, the UK, um, which was at the time part of the European Union. Um, and one of the things that I think is interesting over in Europe is there's a, there's a norm in most European countries, if you're living in a country that's different from your own citizenship, you can't vote at the national level for the president, but you can vote in your city. And the reason is because there's a recognition, like Councillor Lara is saying, that like, I mean, democracy, we the people, it's got to be the people to the left and the right of us around in our city, the people who are doing the work, living their lives, going, like, you know, are just part of the fabric. And I think that um, this, is a, this is a great thing for this council to take up. I think I wouldn't be surprised. I, I think this council might be the first majority, either immigrant or child of immigrant council, maybe for a hundred years going back to the initial Irish um, uh, immigration and I just think uh, I, I think it is a very worthy topic for us to take up so I'm grateful to Councilor Lara and please add my name. Thank you Council Buck. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Thank, thank you President Flynn. Um, also congratulations uh, Councilor Lara on a great maiden speech. Um, my parents had their own immigration citizenship journey here and fortunately are citizens, but so many of my aunties were similarly at polls on election day telling people um, in the English they could muster to vote and they should have also been given that opportunity. There are other cities where this is happening and so as the chair of civil rights and immigrant advancement, I'm very excited for this hearing and to push this through, through so that we can have a more inclusive democracy and so um, we can really center the voices of our immigrants here in our city, so thank you. Thank you, Council Lujan. Uh, anyone else like to speak on, on this matter? Council um, Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Uh, for the record, this is not my maiden speech. I just wanted to <laughs> thank you, um, Council Arar, for your courage and for articulating that so, art so eloquently. Um, I myself, I became a citizen in 2019. I lived in this country for almost 20 years, undocumented. I came when I was 10. I ran a campaign and I wasn't a citizen. Um, and uh, also then ran for office in 2000, voted for the very first time in 2020, and then ran for office in 2021. And today, here I am, a district city councilor. So I deeply understand this issue and have dedicated myself for 33 years to a country, to a society, to a city that I could not vote in. I look forward to the discussion 
And thank you again, and I applaud you for your courage because it does take uh, more than insight, connection, and relativity to be able to understand this issue, but it takes courage for you to actually be at the forefront to lead this. Thank you. And great job when you made the speech. Thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. Uh, the Chair recognizes Council Braden. Council Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I also want to thank uh, Councillor Lara for a, an amazing maiden speech. Very, very important issue that you're raising, and I, I look forward to the conversation when we have the hearing. I also am an immigrant. Uh, I came in 95. I became a citizen in 2008. It's not an easy task to become a citizen. There's many hurdles. But for so many of our immigrants in, in Boston and across our country, that doesn't stop them being civically engaged, participating in all sorts of ways in a democratic process. But they're not allowed to participate by voting. So um, I cut my teeth in working on campaigns over many, many years. And like your father, you know, talked, advocated, was out there, but wasn't able to vote myself. But I, I really feel so much of our municipal government is involved with the daily lives of every Bostonian, uh, whether you come from another country or whether you were born and bred and lived here all your life. And those issues touch every aspect of our lives. So it's really important that, that the, the residents of Boston are given more tools, more opportunity to participate in our civic process. And I really look forward to this conversation about uh, enfranchising uh, more residents of Boston who are immigrants and uh, look forward to bringing that, those voices into the space. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Braden. Anyone else like to speak on this? Anyone else like to add their name? Um, please add Councillor Edwards. Uh, please add Councillor Fernandez Anderson. Please add Councillor Lujan. Please add Councillor Worrell. Please add Councillor Murphy. Please add the chair. And I also wanted to briefly highlight myself and Councillor Edwards always spoke about the veterans community and many of the veterans that are overseas, serving overseas, um, are immigrants themselves. Many of them um, can't vote, um, but here they are serving our country in very difficult environments, hazardous environments, uh, willing to put their life on the line, die for our country, and not have the right to vote. So just want to acknowledge the important hearing that you're bringing forward, Council Lara, and um, you did an outstanding job with your maiden speech. Um, docket 03. 0293 will be referred to the Committee on Civil Rights and Immigration Advancement. Oh, 0323. Um, Committee on Civil Rights, Immigration, Advan Immigration Advancement. Um, docket 0324. Uh, Mr. Clerk, please read 0324. Docket number 0324. Council Louis Jen offered the following order for a hearing on the civil rights and liberties of returning citizens and re-entry into their Boston communities. The, ch the chair recognizes Council, Council Lou and Jen and um, on docket 0324. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, uh, I offer this order, hearing order, so that we can uh, really evaluate and see what we can do more to support our returning citizens. Many of us participated in various forms of the budget listening tour that the mayor held and we heard again and again the ones that I attended from returning citizens themselves about the lack of resources and the lack of uh, and, and what uh, we have we now have an office of returning citizens uh, what we can do to further buttress that office to support the more than 3,000 people a year returning to the city of Boston from prisons and jails who are in need of permanent housing or in need of employment who are in need of driver's licenses, the very basics. And um, sometimes we need more than just referrals. We need people who are actually able to do case management and you know, help people and shepherd them through the process. Um, and we know that this is an issue that disproportionately affects our black and Latinx residents who are uh, overrepresented and disproportionately represented in our criminal legal system. 
Um, and we know that there are particular burdens, burdens that, are, that returning citizens face when it comes to placement in public housing because of, uh, because of very stringent rules around uh, who can reside in public housing. Um, and we also know that the prison system has long housed and held a significant portion of folks suffering from mental health issues. So this is really, uh, when we're talking of, about folks returning or returning citizens, we're talking about connecting them to uh, the mental health resources that they should have gotten in the first place. I had clients um, as a housing attorney who were, I had to go visit in uh, jail when they really should have been uh, receiving services from a psychiatrist and got caught up in a very in our very punitive system. So uh, this is a hearing order to bring together voices in this space, a lot of them being led by returning citizens, to really put our money uh, and focus on really helping people to become whole. Uh, we too often uh, focus uh, on individual, uh, uh, you know, decision making by. Uh, uh, by an individual uh, and not systemic problems and not bad policies that uh, lead to people making uh, sometimes deci uh, decisions that, uh, that lead them to, this, uh, to places of incarceration. So uh, this hearing order, I uh, hope to discuss these issues and bring uh, Office of Returning Citizens together with a lot of folks, Justice for Housing, uh, GBIO has been very active in this space and a, a number of returning citizens. So um, hoping that we can get this uh, uh, as part of the discussion to also talk about it as part of the budget. Thank you. Thank you, Council Uh Would anyone else like Oh, sorry. I'd also add, like to add uh, Council Ryan Worrell to this, uh, to this hearing order. Thank you. Sorry. Council uh, Worrell is added. Um, Council Worrell, would you like to speak on this matter? The Chair recognizes Council Worrell. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Council Louis Jen, for bringing this in. important issue um, to the floor. And, with the shadows, mass incarceration has cast upon too many of our communities, especially black and brown neighborhoods in our city. We need to ensure that those who have served their time can return to their communities with the opportunities, services, and support they need to reintegrate success successfully. Too often, residents end up in our cor correctional facilities because our city has failed to deliver them the education, economic opportunity, um, as Council Louis Jen said, also said, mental health services and stable housing they needed to, and to which they are entitled to. Um, these systemic failures are exactly why we need to assess how we can ensure every returning citizen has their civil rights restored and that our reentry efforts adequately address the root causes of criminal, criminalization and incarceration. I'm proud to support this hearing order so we can better support our returning citizens and, and assess how we interrupt these cycles. Thank you. Thank you, Council Worrell. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Um, the chair recognizes Council Alara. Council Alara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. Well, wow, that feels nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. Um, Councillor Lujan and Councillor Worrell for uh, bringing this hearing order onto the floor. Uh, in a previous life, I served as a street worker uh, and a direct violence intervention worker here in the city of Boston, first in Mattapan and then in Lower Roxbury uh, and in the South End. A large part of the work that I did uh, was to support young people and young men and women who are not only systems involved, but who are currently and previously incarcerated. And so this is an issue that's very near and dear to my heart. I think when we're having conversations, particularly around the civil liberties of people who are currently or formerly incarcerated, we need uh, to expand what civil liberties um, are afforded to them uh, before they become systems involved and also after they come home and want to expand the way that we think about reentry, not only uh, with a problem with a problem-free solution frame, which calls on whether they have education, have a house, and so on and so forth, but to think about the emotional well-being and how they are reintegrated into their community and into the civil process, whether it be through community organizing, voting, and so on and so forth. So I'm really looking forward uh, to this hearing. I'm looking forward to hearing from folks who are currently or previously incarcerated on what the levels of support they need from the city of Boston. And I would also urge us to look beyond the supports that come from city government and look directly to communities to offer uh, the support to these folks. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lara. The chair recognizes Councilor Arroyo. Council Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. Uh, and thank you, Councilor Louis Jen and Council Worrell for uh, offering this. Uh, over 90% of our incarcerated population 
returns back to our communities. That's, that's the number. And so uh, often what they need and what led them into the to be system involved in the first place is stabilization and resources. Uh, and often when they are uh, entering or exiting, they are not receiving those resources. And that's actually a detriment to our public safety, a detriment to them, a detriment to their families. Uh, and if we are serious about ending cycles of trauma, ending cycles of, uh, of harm, uh, we're going to have to be serious about providing resources uh, and dedicating resources to folks. I know this deals specifically as well with some of their civil liberties and the actions we take there, but I also know that it has to deal with and, and does mention uh, the things that we have to do to make sure that we take care of them from a resource uh, standpoint. Uh, and so this is incredibly important work. This has a direct impact on so many people's lives and families' lives uh, and a direct impact on ending cycles of harm and trauma. Uh, and so uh, please add my name. Thank you for your leadership on, on presenting this. And I look forward to uh, hearing not just what comes out of this hearing, but what we do from, the, from that hearing on. Uh, so thank you all. The the chair recognizes Council Louis Jen. Okay. Um, anyone else like to speak on this matter? The chair recognizes Council Baker. I just want to sign my name. Okay. Please add Council Baker's name. Please add Council Block's name, Council Braden, Council Royal, Council Edwards, Council Fernandez Anderson, Council Flaherty, Council Lara, Council Murphy. And please add the chair. I also wanted to highlight that myself and Council Flaherty had several hearings in the past on quarry reform, uh, which is also a critical part of this as well. Governor Patrick did an outstanding job working with the legislature in making uh, reforms to quarry, but we need to go even further than that. As a, as a former probation officer, there's nothing more frustrating for someone coming out of jail or coming out of prison to have that quarry um, hang over their head for their entire life. Uh, not being able to get a job or get into housing, but just want to say thank you from, to my counselors, fellow colleagues, for the incredible work that they've done on this work, on this issue. Um, docket 0293. Okay. Zero, okay. Docket 0234 uh, will be referred to the Committee on Civil Rights I Immigrant Advancement. Three two four, yeah zero three two four. Okay, um, Mr. Quirk, um, please read docket zero three two five. Docket number zero three two five. Councillor Braden and Councillor Flynn offer the offer the following: order for a committee meeting to discuss the organization of quasi public and semi independent entities related to the City of Boston. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Uh, the chair recognizes Councillor Braden. Uh, Councillor Braden, you have the floor. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I want to thank uh, President Flynn for joining me as an original co-sponsor on this order for the appropriate committee, uh, council committee to hold a hearing, no, hold a meeting actually, not a hearing, to discuss quasi-public and semi-independent entities and agencies related to our city government. I filed this order with the, with the intention, along, uh, among, along the same sentiment of the hearing order I filed last council meeting with Councillors Bach and Councillor Louis Jean, to review our organization of city government, city charter and code of ordinances. Knowing that our city is in a turning point for a new, with a new mayoral administration and being a city council with two thirds of new members serving for their first or second term. I believe a general overview to understand the basic structure of the quasi-public and semi-independent agencies of our city would greatly benefit our collective institutional knowledge of city government and help demystify many misconceptions. As a first term city councillor two years ago, my office had to learn the ins and outs of how to discern the functions, responsibilities, budgets and authorities of these entities which operate separate separate from our city government and city hall. These, these entities include the Boston Housing Authority, the Boston Public Health Commission, 
the Boston Redevelopment Authority, BRA, and the, Environment, and the Economic Development Industrial Corporation, also all of the, those two entities doing business uh, um, as the Boston Planning and Development Agency, the Boston Water and Sewer Commission, the Boston Finance Commission, and the trustees of the Boston Public Library, all of which have their enabling legislation as state statute varying financial relationships with the city, with their governing boards appointed by the mayor, and, and some which we confirm, not all. As a legislative body of the city government, which has the right to consider legislation affecting these bodies and their public-facing operations, it is our duty to have a baseline understanding of the structure, function, history, and enabling legislation. I drafted this order as a committee meeting rather than as a hearing so that we may focus on setting a strong foundation among councillors of knowledge on the organisation of these entities and prioritise dialogue for the administration to ask background questions councillors to answer background questions that councillors may have. Uh, we've talked about um, in, t in the past few months we talked about uh, the Boston Water and Sewer Commission and their the diversity of their workforce. We're talking about Boston Health, uh, Public Health Commission. I think this is a timely opportunity just to get a better understanding of how these, who, what these quasi-public uh, and semi-independent uh, entities are and how they function and how they relate to our um, roles as city councillors. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Braden. Uh, the chair recognizes the second original sponsor, Councillor uh, Council President Flynn. Thank you, Council of Royo. Um, thank you, Council of Braden, for including me on this, on this hearing order. And I know it'll be very helpful to me, but also be very helpful to all of our colleagues because those quasi agencies play a critical role in a lot of quality of life issues in the city of Boston, whether it's the water and sewer, the, the critical role the public library system plays um, in Boston, certainly the BPDA. Boston Housing Authority. It will be informative for all of us, including um, our, our new colleagues, but that's what makes us a better body, is learning from each other and learning from other city or, or quasi-agency departments and making sure that we can provide the best services and quality of life to residents. Um, thank you, Council Royal. Thank you, President Flynn. Would anyone else like to speak on the matter? Seeing uh, no hands, would anyone else like to uh, add their name? Uh, Mr. Clerk, please add Councillor Baker. Please add Councillor Bach. Uh, please add Councillor Tanya Fernandez-Anderson. Please add Councillor Flaherty. Please add Councillor Lara. Please add Councillor uh, Louis Jen. Please add Councillor Murphy. And please add Councillor Worrell. And please add my name. Uh, docket 0325 will be assigned to the Committee on the Whole. Uh, Mr. Clerk, would you read docket number 326? Document number 0326, Councillor Braden and Councillor Bach offer the following. A resolution condemning the unprovoked invasion and egregious act of aggression against Ukraine by the Russian Federation. Thank you, uh, Mr. Clerk. The chair recognizes Councillor Braden. Uh, Councillor Braden, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I move to suspend one Add President Flynn as an original co-sponsor. Seeing and hearing no objections, Councillor Flynn is added as the third original co-sponsor. Councillor Braden, you have the floor. Uh, just as how the, the uh, Council has adopted resolutions in the past condemning war and imperialism across the globe, I offer this resolution today to condemn Russia's egregious invasion of Ukraine. Let's call it what it is. It's a war. When you're uh, firing uh, cruise missiles into populations, civilian populations, it's a war. As we have seen in the news early Thursday morning, February 24th, the President of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin, launched a full-scale invasion of sovereign Ukraine. The number of dead and injured, both military and civilian, is undetermined and growing, but the cost of this act of aggression will be lives, livelihoods, homes and, and cities, and the impact will reverberate beyond Ukraine and Eastern Europe, and it will reverberate in this country as well. To date, it looks like 800,000 Ukrainians have already been forced to seek refuge in neighboring countries, and up to 4 million Ukrainians are expected to be displaced. 
in this act of war. We must also condemn the threat of nuclear aggregation that, was, that has precariously mounted since the 2014 annexation of Crimea. Just less than three months ago, I introduced a resolution uh, that was adopted by the Council renouncing nuclear weapons proliferation and urging the United States to pull back from the brink and prevent nuclear war. In this situation in Ukraine, we are that one step closer to uh, an un unanticipated and unexpected escalation into a nuclear conflict. We must affirm our unwavering support for Ukraine's independence, sovereignty, self-governance and territorial integrity by calling for the immediate cessation of that violence and the legal Russian invasion of Ukraine, which has lacked regard for citizens' lives, and commend the courage, resolve and resilience shown by the Ukrainian people, both in Ukraine and overseas here in Boston, uh, and in here, here in Boston, in their pursuit of sovereignty and democracy. On the humanitarian front, we must ensure all citizens have safe passage to escape, inclu and, and that the, um, including black Ukrainians who have been held back from fleeing and seeking asylum. We must also increase aid efforts to, for refugee resettlement, both nationally and locally, for those who are displaced, both as a result of the war in Ukraine, as, as, <coughs> as well as those who have been and will continue to seek asylum before and after Ukraine. What we're seeing in the te on the television in this moment, we're in the 21st century, it's such a sad and, and tragic situation that we do not have better mechanisms to solve and, 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 and promote international cooperation and peace. And uh, I do urge you to, my colleagues, to support this resolution. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Braden. Councillor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, Today, for Catholics and Episcopalians like myself, is uh, Ash Wednesday. Um, and Ash Wednesday is a day of reflecting on our mortality and fragility um, and the extent to which we all ultimately depend on God and one another. Um, and I think that uh, when we see a situation like the situation in Ukraine, um, the, there are you know, a million conversations about what are the foreign policy options, about the looming terror, as Councillor uh, uh, Braden said of nuclear war, um, but I think that the first thing that we can do and that we must do and that um, to its credit I think the world has largely done in this moment um, is, is to lift up our prayers and that was why it was so um, good to be joined by Father Roman at the beginning of this meeting um, and to stand in solidarity with one another. And I think that um, this resolution is a way for this council, the city council of the city of Boston in the United States. Um, far away from Ukraine and yet home to a Ukrainian American community here as we heard this morning um, and as we are home as we've been discussing to so many um, communities of immigrants that still feel that that tether and tie um, to war-torn uh, homes. Um, I think that what we can do here in the council today is to is to say that we stand with the Ukrainian people um, and to express as the resolution expresses um, not, not only condemnation and then that standing with, but also recognizing that Boston should be a, a home and a welcoming place for refugees and migrants from all countries, just as we um, uh, joined in supporting the resolution on uh, against Title 42 a few weeks ago. Um, I think that uh, not, you know, no one city anywhere in the world right now can be all of what the Ukrainian people need. The Ukrainian people are reaching within themselves their own resources, um, and yet the world we have has to figure out all the things that we can do, um, and 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 just recognize together that when we many decades ago made the faithful decision uh, as a as a humanity to uh, move towards nuclear weapons and towards um, a, a destructive form of force that quite literally ties all of our fates up together. Um, that that also obligates us to think in universal terms about solidarity in moments like this. So I do hope that the council will join us in passing this resolution today. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Bach. Uh, the, uh, I'd like now to uh, recognize uh, Council President Flynn. Uh, Council President Flynn, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Council, Council of Royo, and just wanted to highlight the some of the Ukrainian flag-raising ceremonies we've had with 
Councilor Flaherty and Councilor, Councilor Baker and Councilor O'Malley that was, that was here before um, with attorney Nick Zazula, who's one of the leaders there in the community and Professor Peter Walzenchuk. Um, but it was a great, great to see the Ukrainian, Ukrainian community during these flag raising ceremonies. But what we also learned from the community is their love of country and their love, love of democracy. And as, as Councillor Braden and Councillor Bach uh, discussed on this Ash Wednesday, we pray for, for peace and an end to this senseless war and suffering across, across Europe and across Ukraine. And we continue to stand with the Ukrainian people during this very difficult time. The U.S. has always stood with people in need, and that's something we're proud of and we're going to continue to do. Uh, thank you, Councillor Royal. Thank you, President Flynn. Uh, the chair now recognizes uh, Councillor Flaherty. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Rise to support Ukraine. Please add my name to this resolution and through the chair to the makers if they would consider uh, a sixth resolve in that calling upon the Biden administration to stop buying oil from Russia. It's been reported that we may be buying uh, somewhere in the vicinity of 600,000 barrels a day. The fact that we're participating in their economy is unconscionable, not to mention we're getting price gouged. So, uh, through the chair to the makers, if they would consider a sixth resolve, calling upon the Biden administration to stop buying oil from Russia. Thank you, Councillor Flaherty. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Councillor Bach. Councillor Bach, the floor is yours. Or Councillor, sorry, not Councillor Bach, Councillor Braden. Uh, I'm, I thank, you, thank my colleague for his um, amendment to our resolution. I'd be happy to add that. Thank you. So, I, so I also had another um, two comments. I, I, in Alston Brighton, we have a large immigrant population of uh, elderly, retired uh, Russian and Ukrainian uh, folks. Um, many of them. Uh, fought in World War II to defeat fascism and to defeat Nazism. Uh, I really want to stress in this moment that uh, Russian folks living in the city of Boston are not our enemy. Many of them fled oppression and persecution in the former Soviet Union, and they sought shelter and they were refugees here, along with their uh, Ukrainian neighbors. So I want to stress that uh, while we condemn the actions of President Putin and the Russian Federation in this moment, that we embrace and support our Russian and Ukrainian neighbors in our, dis in our, neighbor in our district and in our cities. Thank you, Councillor Braden. Uh, and before I just go to the opens, uh, it, it sounds like that's a yes for adding the six resolve uh, that uh, Councillor Flaherty suggested. Is there, that's so, I'm seeing nodded heads from all of the original co-sponsors. Uh, I'm now going to go to uh, Councillor Baker. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you for my colleagues for bringing this, bringing this to bear here. Um, very, very important issue that we stand with the Ukrainian people. Um, in my quest to educate myself on things other than Boston, I started listening to um, political podcasts, and I came across a woman, Ann Applebaum, who broke down the the Ukrainian, um, Ukrainian Russian issue that's happening and, and, and what she had described it as is very similar to what the English had done to to the Irish. Um, they they wanted them to be English subjects and the Irish wouldn't have it. They they went so far as to to even starve the Irish people going back to the eighteen thirties, which is why the diaspora happened in Ireland and why you have Irish people all over the the entire world, as early as nine, as late as 1930. Now, this this um, this policy goes back to Tsar Nicholas, and was also enacted by Joseph Stalin. So, in the 30s, they called it the Holomor. They went door to door in the Ukraine, taking their food to starve them out, the exact same way that they did to the Irish people. So, this is the type of long-standing political battle that's going on and, and and let's not forget that that when Hitler came in, Hitler came into Poland first. Ukraine's right next to that. So this is scary, scary time and 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 I'm thrilled that you guys put this on the floor here today and glad to add my name. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Baker. Uh Councillor Louis Jen, the floor is yours. Um Thank you, Councilor Arroyo, and thank you for, uh, to the sponsors for introducing this. Um, 
So many of us uh, right now are, you know, standing in solidarity with what's happening with Ukrainians who did not ask for this war and with many Russians who also did not ask for this war. Just want to make sure that we are also highlighting the plight of migrants uh, of, all sh of, all, of all colors who find themselves in Ukraine, um, even in times of war, xenophobia and anti-blackness reared its ugly head. And it is, uh, you know, as someone who is, you know, wants to be and is upset by the fact of war, um, by the act of war, it is, it hurts doubly more when you see migrants, when you see um, uh, folks of Arab descent, when you see black folks uh, being denied uh, entry into other countries as they too seek refuge. So as we uh, address the issues here of war, of imperialism, of, uh, let's also not forget, that uh, migrants in countries, whether in the United States or in the Ukraine, also deserve uh, safety and uh, to be free from harm and persecution and war as well. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Louis Jen. Councillor Edwards, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I echo the comments of my colleagues as well, um, especially the comments from Councillor Braden, noting that uh, the Russian people are not our enemy. I had the honor of getting to know and befriend a uh, um, Katya who lives in Russia right now, and it was just somewhat surreal that I what, what's after and said, how are you and what's going on? And for her to respond and say, none of us want this. We don't want this. This is not us. And I really want a lot of us, to, uh, my colleagues, my, my neighbors, my friends, to understand that the, the Russian people are equally not, are not behind this. This is the result of a madman, a dictator, and someone who honestly probably wasn't even legally elected to lead his country. So even his, his authorities, I believe, in question. Um, I also want to um, shift, um, not so much shift the focus, but also add to this conversation, uh, there's something special Councillor Flynn and I both share, and that is our uh, military uh, connection. And I want you to know that when talks of war happen, there's a special kind of feeling you get in your gut. Um, my mother served in the, in the Air Force, and I grew up on military bases during Iraq I. Uh, everyone feels that part of that unique community, especially when you're the child of someone who could be deployed. Um, and so we had therapy, we had people dealing with those of us who were going to school every day and knowing our parents going to work was going to Iraq and going to deal with and possibly not come home. So this is, this is a message also to those who are serving in the military, those who are serving, of course, already in the military in, in, in Ukraine, but also to those who are coming and volunteering in different countries around the world, and especially ours, and to those who have been retired. I know you feel it as well. You feel the sense of it's, it might be time, it might be coming up, it might be one of us. And I just want you to know you, of course, have all, my solidarity, my sense, and, and um, my patriotism, and I wanted that to express that and to thank those who have already answered that call and ultimately had the ultimate sacrifice for this country. But, you know, being a kid of the 19, 1980s, a, lo a good chunk of my childhood was during the Cold War on a military base. This is eerily uh, familiar feeling. It's eerily familiar about Russia. It's eerily familiar feeling, and so I want to acknowledge that feeling, and there are a lot of us who are feeling it, so um, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Edwards. Uh, would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Seeing no, uh, no hands, would anyone else like to add their, oh, uh, if I can. Yeah. Council thank President you. Flynn, the floor is yours. Thank you, Councillor Arroyo. I'll be very brief. Just wanted, wanted to respond to my good friend and colleague, Councillor Edwards. Um, we spent a lot of time over the last four years talking about military families, and um, you added so much to the, to the discussion. I also want to recognize our, our other colleague, uh, Tanya Fernandez-Anderson, is also a military family. And we also know the, the sacrifices of Tanya in, in her family as well during this difficult time in our, in our country. So I just wanted to acknowledge my, acknowledge our colleague as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council President Flynn. Uh, would anyone else like to add their name? Please add Councillor Edwards, Mr. Clerk. Please add Councillor Fernandez-Anderson. Please add Councillor Lara. 
Please add Councilor Louis Jen. Please add Councilor Murphy. Please add Councilor Rell, and please add the chair. Uh, at this time, I'm going to turn it back to uh, Council President Flynn. Uh, but I do believe that there's a motion on the floor from Councilor Flaherty that is uh, to adopt new language that that is being uh, brought out. And then I think there will be a vote on that amendment, and then a vote uh, to suspend and pass uh, in, in today. So, uh, Council President Flynn, uh, should I stand here? Or do you want to? Perfect. Yeah, I'll take care of it. Uh, I don't know if the, I know that the, the, Mr. Clerk, do we already have the copy up? Uh, I see Councilor Flaherty has his, Councilor Flaherty, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The, the language is being uh, just drafted to, for the friendly amendment, and it just requires a second and a quick vote of the council. Maybe just a quick brief recess. I know they're in uh, you ladies' office typing. That's, uh, we'll take a brief recess until we have the, until we have that in front of us. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair.
officially uh, back in session. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I now recognize uh, Councillor Flaherty. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through the chair, I see to the makers a friendly amendment to add a sixth resolve calls on the Biden administration to stop buying oil from Russia. Requires a second and a vote, and we can move forward. Thank you. Uh, so seconded. Uh, it now, Mr. Clerk, if you can do a roll call vote uh, on the motion to amend. Roll call vote on a motion to amend. Councillor Arroyo. Yes. Councillor Arroyo, yes. Councillor Baker. The motion to amend. The amend. Yes. Councilor Baker, yes. Councilor Bach. Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden. Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Edwards. Yes. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Lara. Councilor Lara, yes. Councilor Louis Jen. Yes. Councilor Louis Jen, yes. Councilor, Louis Jen, yes. Councilor Mejia. Councilor Murphy. Councilor Murphy, yes, and Councilor Worrell. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Uh, the resolution will be so amended. Uh, now uh, we are seeking a vote, uh, a suspension of the rules and passage of this docket uh, as amended, number 326. Uh, all those in favor say aye. All opposed, aye. All opposed say nay. Uh, the, A's have, the ayes have it. Docket 326 is passed. Thank you, Council Royal. We're, we're going into personnel orders. <clears throat> Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0327. Docket number 0327, Councilor Flynn for Councilor Bach. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0327. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read 0328. Docket number 0328, Council of Flynn for Council of Flaherty. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 0328. All of those, all those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read Docket 0329. Docket number 0329, Council of Flynn over the following. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 0329. All of those in favor say aye. All opposed say nay. nay, the ayes have it. The docket has passed. We're on to late files. Um, I am informed by the clerk that there is one late file matter. The late file matter is a letter of absence from City Council Mejia, which I will read into the record. Yeah, Mr. Clerk, please read into the record. Uh, correspondence from the office of Julia Mejia, City Council at large. Uh, Ed Flynn, President of the Boston City Council. Dear Mr. President, I am writing to inform you of my absence during today's City Council meeting. I am currently away and unable to attend in person. A representative from my staff will be listening in and following <coughs> up with me upon my return. Though I am not able to vote given my absence, I would like to go on record as, as in strong support of the proposed transfer fee home rule petition. I appreciate your understanding and that of the rest of the City Council. Sincerely, Julia Mejia, Boston City Council, Councilor at Large. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Um, we're going on to green sheets. Yeah, okay. Um, that letter will be placed on file. We're going on to green sheets. Anyone wishing to remove a matter from the green sheets may do so at this time. Um, the chair recognizes Council Lara. Council Lara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. I would like to pull docket 0275 from page three of the green sheets. Mr. Clerk, would you please read docket 0275 into the record? Docket number 0275 from the Committee on Environmental Justice, Resiliency, and Parks. Message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expand a grant in the amount of $65,000 awarded by the Barr Foundation to be administered by the Mayor's Office. The grant will support the national uh, search process to fill the position of Senior Advisor 
with a Green New Deal for the city of Boston. Mr. Clerk, um, can you please poll the committee members to see if they would allow the DACA to come before this body? Members of the Environmental Justice and Resiliency and Parks Committee, com uh, Councilor Lara. Yes. Councilor Braden. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Worrell. Councilor Worrell, yes. Councilor Bach. Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. And Councilor Edwards. Yes. Councilor Edwards, yes. Thank you, Mr. Corporal. Uh, docket 0275 is now properly before the body. Council Lowry, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. Uh, docket 0275 is a $65,000 grant to, to support the national search process uh, to fill the position of senior advisor for the Green New Deal for the city of Boston. The city is hiring a cabinet level Green New Deal advisor to lead the administration's ambitious goal of combating climate change and implementing a Boston's Green New Deal. This selection process is going to be led by the City Search Committee. Uh, given the most recent reports uh, about the state of, of climate change in the country and the size of the grant, as the Chair of the Committee on Environmental Justice, Resiliency, and Parks, I want to recommend passage of this docket. Council Lara moves for passage of docket 0275. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. Docket 0275 has passed. We're on to consent agenda. I've been informed by the clerk that there, are, there is one addition to the consent agenda. The chair moves for adoption of the consent agenda as presented. All of those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. The consent agenda has been, has been adopted. We're on to announcements. Does anyone have any announcements at this time? The chair recognizes District City Councilor Lydia Edwards. Councilor Edwards, you have the floor. I have uh, two, two announcements. Uh, the first is just to uh, notify folks of the passing of a North End staple, a good friend of the community and one of the founders and of the Casa Maria Senior Center, Ricky Anzalotti, uh, died recently. Um, he is, again, the former president of St. Mary's Trust, and again, it organized the Casa Maria, which is where a lot of our elders stay in the North End. He's helped countless people in the neighborhood <coughs> find housing, uh, food. He's been part of all the charitable events. He's really been a staple to the community and has been a core for many of us, and it was an unexpected passing. Um, he's deeply loved. Uh, his son and his, and his widow are just amazed by the amount of people who've come to support. I think the line for his funeral mass was out the door. It's, it's just one of those sad things to have to report that Boston lost a great one. And I wanted people to know that. Um, and he, of course, was presented with a citation on behalf of this body, acknowledging the loss of the, uh, of the community. So um, may Ricky Anzalotti rest in peace. Um, the other announcement I have to say is one of inspiration and again speaks to the strength of our, and resilience of our city and our neighborhoods. As many of you know, uh, there was a fire in East Boston and it displaced ultimately 25 people. Um, all different backgrounds, income levels, we had BPS kids, we have seniors, all of whom are now currently <coughs> homeless. But I want to thank actually people for coming out there. I especially want to thank Natalia Bene Benetis who is East Boston's liaison. I think she was there at three o'clock in the morning and then was there when I got there for hours. And I wanna thank her for her leadership and doing what a lot of people forget ONS is supposed to do. The Office of Neighborhood <coughs> Services shows up at every single fire. And she did that. Uh, John Romano also came as well. Um, and as well as Brianna Miller from uh, the Office of Neighborhood Services. I wanna thank uh, the Red Cross who was there right away, made sure people were warm, made sure that they got um, food, made sure that they were assessed for any injuries. And the Red Cross, again, is one of the first responders that shows up at every single fire that we have. Um, I want to um, also thank um, Commissioner Dempsey in the Boston Fire Department, um, as well as Representative Madero, and just the leadership that I saw from Nicole De Silva from BCYF is just incredible. Um, we have a GoFundMe going that's into the tens of thousands of dollars and raising huge amounts of necessary resources. Uh, we have contacted all the families. 
And while they are dispersed right now, our goal is to bring them back to East Boston and make sure that they're stably housed. We're working very hard on that. Um, again, I just want to thank the entire Boston community and greater Boston community that's come out who has been supportive, who have been part of this entire process. Um, I'm going to be tweeting out the GoFundMe link. Um, we're going to keep it live for about a week with the hope that we can raise enough resources uh, to get people uh, at least first, last, security, some food, and clothing. Uh, again, we have three kids, a set of twins, single mom, really spoke to my, my heart, um, that lost everything. They woke up at 3 o'clock to find out all their things were gone. A couple was on vacation actually in Hawaii to see on the news that their apartment was burned to the ground. So they're not even coming, they're coming back still to figure out what they have left. So it's traumatic. And a lot of the unsexy part happens now because it's months of recovery from this trauma and trying to build their lives back together. Thank you all for tweeting out the link. Thank you all for supportive. And you have my neighborhood and our support if, God forbid, this happens in any of your neighborhoods as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Edwards. The chair recognizes Councilor Baker. Um, Councilor Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry for being so chatty today. Um, I just want to, to talk briefly about not my oldest brother, my second oldest brother. Tomorrow will be 29 years. He passed away, passed away from a heroin, heroin overdose, left three young kids that are all adults now. Um, he was my hero. He had something that I never had, was a shot from the top of the key. He was just unbelievable, a, a person that everybody loved. You knew him. Everybody loved him. He, he was never able to love himself. And ultimately, the drug that that tamps our pain down took his life. It, he was finally had, when he died, he had been sober for a year, which was the most time he had had in 20, 20 plus years. So just thinking of my brother Rick today on his anniversary. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Baker. Anyone else like to speak, make an announcement? Um, we're going on to memorials. Today we will adjourn our meeting in memory of the following individuals. For Councillor Arroyo, Edward Jeffries. For Councillors Arroyo, Luajen and Morell, Preston Settles. For Councillor Bach, Jack Crawford, Lawrence Sampson, and Bob Mermel. For Councillor Braden, Marie Leonard. For Councillor Edwards, Henry, Ricky, and Zalata. For Councillor Flynn, Paul Ferris, Heidi Streck. For Councillors Flynn, Baker, and Flaherty, Barry Dorian, Jennifer Carr. For Council, for Council Louis Jean, Dr. Paul Farmer, and Desiree, Ida, Monroe, LaFont. For Council Murphy, Nurse Patricia Gauday. For the entire City Councilor, former Boston City Councilor Rosemary Sansone. A moment of silence, please. The chair moves that when the council adjourns today, it does so in memory of those mentioned individuals, and we are scheduled to meet again in the Ionella Chamber on Wednesday, March 9th at 12 noon. All in favor of adjournment, please say aye. Aye. We are now adjourned.